But our evening begins with a rare treat from the Atlantic Magazine as part of their ongoing series of conversations with fascinating people doing important work. Our conversation tonight is between John Legend and lauded national correspondent Tanahasi Coates. Tanahasi has written some of the magazine's most deeply reported and provocative cover stories, his memoir, Between the World and Me, a letter to his son about his experience of race and racism, won the National Book Award last year. And in a few weeks, his cover story, A History of the First Black Presidency and What Came Next, will run on the Atlantic. So, without further ado, we are so proud to welcome to our stage nine-time Grammy Award-winning Columbia recording artist, John Legend and ta Coates from The Atlantic. Please take it away. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to say. Are we supposed to introduce this whole thing? Or it's already been introduced. But I'm excited to be here uh, with Ta-Nehisi, one of my favorite writers. who has been very influential the way I think about what's going on in America right now. And I think he's been influential for a lot of people. And uh, we're excited to talk about this music, talk about this country, whatever he wants to talk about today. So welcome. and. Uh, Give it up for ta -Nehisi one more time. That's so awkward. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one singing. <laughs> you don't want me to sing. Um, I'm going to uh, just, you know, uh, throw up passes for John. I just want to hear, you know, John talk. And so my job is to uh, get John to talk as much as possible uh, and then get out of the way and let John sing, as I say. Um, John, I actually want to, you know, uh, begin with a, you know, a really, really basic question. I've been pumping the new album all week, um, not because I had to come here, but just, you know, for my own individual pleasure. I actually write to music, so music is actually really, really important to my process. So, um, how do you know when it's time to record a new album? Like, what's the moment when you're like, okay, you know, I think it's time to put out something else? That's well, cool. I'm a bit of a workaholic, so. If I get off tour, I go on vacation for a couple weeks, and then I'm like, okay, it's time to make a new album. Um, I, don't, I don't need like a kind of a lightning bolt of inspiration to say, okay, I know what I want the album to be about. I figure that the writing process will give me those lightning bolts eventually, but I just have to go and try to receive it. I have to go and try to, to make it happen. And to me, the best advice I give to writers is is what I see, I've seen you give too, is to write. And it makes you better as a writer and everything's not gonna be amazing, but if you just keep writing, uh, you'll come up with some good stuff and eventually you'll come up with some great stuff and hopefully something that's transcendent and really special. But you have to commit yourself to actually just going in and doing it. And for me, that process is going to the studio. It's calling up another co-writer and say, let's get in a room together and write for four or five or six hours. and usually we end up with a song at the end of that session. It might not be great. Some of them we just scrap and never use again. Some of them get recorded and we still decide that it's not worthy of the album. And then some of them become, you know, the songs that you all hear us put out. But that process is important to me. So this album, we probably wrote 40 or 50 songs. The last one, you know, maybe even more. And so every album, I go through that process. So it's not really waiting for some events to happen to inspire me, it's more pushing myself to go right and figuring that something will come. So, like, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like deeply enchanted with process and creative process. And so when you say right, like for you, does that mean, like what comes first, is it words, is it- It's music words? usually first, so I'll start, we'll, you know, be in a room and, for instance, uh, the song that uh, Blake and Miguel and I, Blake Mills, who's here, our producer and, uh, and co-writer on a lot of the album. Miguel, Blake, and I went into the studio. We had nothing planned. We didn't know what we were going to do. And we just started playing around on our instruments. Uh, I was on the piano. He was on the guitar. 
uh, and started trying to find chords that were interesting. And once you find some chords that are interesting, then I usually end up singing some melodies over those chords. And oh, that melody sounds cool. It really fits well over that chorus or over that chord progression. And then those melodies start to form into kind of babble that ends up being words eventually. And once you kind of grab onto a few lines, I think, uh, it was like that. That was like the first melody that, that we wrote for, for Overload with Miguel. And we started hearing the words overflowed and overload and explode and you start to hear those words and you start to think of what what could I build around that song and what lyric could I build around that song and and then you start getting into storytelling and 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 you want it to rhyme you want it to sing well you want all that to, to be right but you also want it to tell an interesting story from an interesting point of view and uh, eventually you get to that place and you might fine-tune those lyrics a bit but once you lay out that melodic format and the chord progression you at least have kind of the template for what the song is going to be. And then a lot of the tweaks end up being lyrical changes or, oh, this could be a little different. Or, uh, let's say it more, you know, sharply or say it more beautifully or sing it more beautifully. And uh, I don't think that song lyrics always need to read well as, as you know, just read uh, poetry as poetry person, would. Yeah. But I think it... It's nice if it does, but it's most crucial that it sings well um, to me. Uh, so I want it to sound great and to feel great as it's being listened to. Um, the medium is not to read it as poetry. The medium to me is to listen to it and enjoy it. The funny thing about that is like, I always feel like in order for it to read well, and I'm talking about things that are on the page, it should actually sing well. Yeah, and I, and I, I grew up, and when I think about my speeches, because I go out and talk to people all the time, I think about the melody of the speech and the rhythm of the speech, too. And I, I grew up with a bunch of preachers in my family. So to me, speaking as music uh, was part of just my life. My grandfather was a preacher. My uncle was a preacher. My uh, multiple uncles are preachers. Uh, so a lot of the way I think about speaking and the way I think about even writing essays or whatever, I think in that rhythm of what a preacher would, 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 would think. Did they feel any sort of way about secular music? Oh yeah, they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny we're singing this in a church. There will be some secular music tonight. Um, but you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a pretty fundamentalist home, uh, Pentecostal. Um, you know, the women weren't allowed to wear pants. Uh, we weren't allowed to go to the movies when I was a kid. Uh, weren't allowed to listen to secular music, really, uh, as young kids. Eventually we were, but as pretty young kids, all we had was gospel music at home. And uh, the idea of you singing the devil's music, um, it was like, you know, it was forbidden, uh, at least early in my life. And, you know, pretty soon my parents got divorced when I was 10, and all that started to unravel. And they just let us do whatever we want eventually. But, but when, when I was a kid, it was, you know, you don't sing secular music. You know, you just don't do it. You don't do this, you don't do that. There were a lot of things you couldn't do. Yeah, and this is like a constant thing for black singers. Sam Cooke goes through the same thing. Yeah, you thing. go through the history, yeah. Mar Marvin right. Gaye, right. like all these, Charles, all yeah. these singers were always dealing with the forbidden nature of secular music. And I think that was part of what inspired their art was that sense of uh, danger uh, that the music they were singing. Are you being autobiographical when you say that? Like, is that true? Well, I think it's all of us. It's me, and I think it's uh, a lot of the music that I've look, look, looked up to in my, in my uh, growing up and, and, and discovering my, you know, the, the idols that I look to at, uh, in music, a lot of them dealt with that kind of spiritual, secular conflict. And, uh, you know, I think it's been written about a lot and talked about a lot, but it's true. So you say you got 30, 40, 50 songs put together. Yeah. And when you're cutting down to the album for this album, for instance, yeah. are you thinking thematically or is it just give me the, give me the, you know, the hottest bangers? Like, what, I think what is it's it? a combination because part of it, if you have a great song, you want to use it. So it's like you don't want to not use it, but you basically try to find what you think is the core of the awesomeness on your album and then build around it. So you know where you, you know what their best stuff is and you know if that fits who you are, you know if that fits the 
the musical thing you're trying to say on the album and to some extent lyrical as well. And then you just build around it and make sure everything else serves uh, that same master. Uh, but you still want your best stuff on the album. And, and for this album, was there a core like that? Were there songs in particular that formed the core? Yeah, thing that I you think built like um, Darkness and Light, Penthouse, uh, those were like early songs that felt like core songs. Um, other songs felt like good songs, but we had to make them fit into that, you know, vibe. And so we had to go back and maybe rewrite a, a few lines or maybe go back and rearrange uh, the songs. Some of the songs, it took us a while to find the spot in the arrangement that made it fit with the stuff that we knew was already great. Uh, and so we just kept working on it until we did. Are you like, a, you know, the kind of artist, like, did you need, like, inspiration for other things? Or is it more workman? Like, I know you talked about the idea that you got to actually just go and do it. Do you have to just, you need to just get in the studio? Or is there something else that has to happen? Well, I think, obviously, I write about my life. Um, not all of my songs are about my life, but I write a decent amount about my wife, who's here tonight. <laughs> you know, we, we wrote about what it felt like to be a new father. We wrote about things that, you know, actually go on in our lives. But um, even still, I didn't go to the studio saying that day, I'm going to write about this subject, because the music always comes first for me. So the music came first, and then it led me to certain lines, and then I was like, oh, I have a story in my head that fits those lines. I have a narrative that fits those lines. I have a character, even if it's a character, it's not me. I have a character who I want to tell a story about that fits where that song looks like it wants to go. You, you um, obviously are very, very politically active, very, very politically conscious, uh, brother. Is it difficult, uh, a challenge at all, to integrate that in the art, uh, you know, How's that work? Yeah, it's, I think it is hard because, well, first of all, like I said, the song has to sing well, and the things I tweet about or the things I speak about in my speeches might not make great songs. Like the way I would talk about them in prose or I would talk about them in other media might not translate well into a great soul song. And so I have to think about that when I'm writing lyrics. But for this album, one of the goals we had was to make sure that that side of my persona was represented on this album as well, even though people know I write great love songs and uh, people get married to my songs and all these other things. And that's still an important part of who I am. Uh, we wanted to show other sides of my persona that people know pretty well, but haven't seen me sing a lot about. And did you grow up in like a, um, I'm, I'm always interested in this, cause, you know, I grew up in this household where, you know, it was like, you know, age five, you got to read Malcolm X, and you know what I mean? Mine was age five, you got to read Genesis, Exodus, <laughs> Leviticus, so Numbers, how, how did, Deuteronomy. <laughs> so how, how did the process happen for you? Like, where did, where did that Well, but also, that being said, my, my parents took us to the library all the time because we were homeschooled, and part of, uh, you know, we were homeschooled for multiple years during my grade school years. So part of that education was taking us to the library and telling us to pick out books. And I was obsessed with reading about civil rights leaders. I, I was like interested in reading about, you know. Do you, do you know why? I don't like, do you know, know why, I just, I just felt like I wanted to feel like a pride in my history and where I came from and, and, and it made me feel like, like, I don't know, that was special to me to know that I came from that line of people that, you know, marched on Washington, that, that, you know, uh, led the Underground Railroad. It felt special to me to come from that what line of people. What age are we talking about? I'm talking like seven, eight, nine years old. Like I, I was, hated that stuff when I was I seven. was interested in that as a kid, and I would pick those things out. I would read about sports, too. Like, I'd read about, but I'd read about Jackie Robinson, you know? Like, I would read about people who fought for justice or who uh, fought against the odds to, to do something special. And so I think that's always been a part of what inspired me and motivated me. And, uh, and so, you know, my parents weren't particularly political, but I think just them taking me to the library was enough. Right, right. And you know, one of the big issues that I've seen you've been be like really, really active. I mean, your, obviously your activism is, you know, spanned. You know, I, I remember having a conversation with you about education a little while back. You know, and one of the things you're, you know, dealing with now, right, is like this, this plague of mass incarceration, which, uh, 
regrettably, I don't want to offend anybody, uh, but regrettably in the current political climate, like we, we've had some setbacks, definitely, I would say. Clearly. Yeah, to, to understate things a little yeah. bit. Um, <laughs> You've done a lot of work around felon disenfranchisement, and you know, given this election that just passed, you know, I, ju I just want you to speak a little bit about that. Well, I think we need to think about disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement beyond just felons, because you know, if you look at things like voter ID and and other methods that have been, you know, explicitly shown in the courts to be specifically targeted at certain groups that don't vote for Republicans. Uh, there's been a concerted effort throughout the country to uh, make sure fewer black people vote, fewer brown people vote, fewer uh, people who've been through the prison system, fewer uh, elderly people, uh, fewer poor people. Uh, there have been concerted efforts to target those people that tend to vote Democratic and make sure you make it harder for them to vote. Cutting down early voting, cutting down locations in certain neighborhoods, and North Carolina said it was almost surgical, the level of precision that went into doing that. And part of that surgical precision went into these felon disenfranchisement laws where they said, oh, we know if we lock up so many people in this community uh, and we don't like the way they vote, then we can make sure they don't vote at all by imposing these laws. And, you know, people go through prison, they, they pay their debt to society, which usually is too long of a sentence to begin with. And then when they come out, we take away their freedom even though they're supposedly free. And, and that's just one area, but it's also harder for them to get a job, harder th for them to get a home, as you wrote about in your uh, piece on mass incarceration, harder for them to get a home, even to rent one. You know, we make their life difficult in every single way we can. And so the punishment far outlasts their uh, time in prison. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is make it easier for people who have been formerly incarcerated to come out and be able to vote. Um, but I think it's part of a larger story of making sure that we have full, uh, f a full franchise in the country where no matter where you're from, as long as you're a citizen of this country, uh, no matter what you've done, that you should be able to participate in the democracy that's going to affect you. Because every decision that our politicians make uh, has an effect on the people, and they're doing it with our money and in our name. And so no matter what we've done, we should have the right to have a voice in that. Artistically, like, does that, like, do you feel like you have a platform and therefore, like, you have to address, like, it's incumbent upon you to address certain things? I feel like I do. I don't feel like every artist does, but I feel like... Wait, I'm sorry, you said you don't feel like every artist does? I don't feel like every artist does because they don't do the work to, to be informed about what's happening. If they did, then maybe they should, but I feel like if you know what's happening, if you're paying attention, if you can articulate your concerns, and you have the place and the position where you can, then you should. So um, as we move to the end of this, I want, I want to ask something really personal. And I'm sorry, this is a little awkward, especially in this house where, where, where uh, you know, we're having this conversation. Are, does religion still play a role in your life today? Um, I would say not really. I would say uh, I'm not religious. But I, if you listen to my music, you know where I've come from as an artist. And there's a spiritual core to my music that will never go away, despite me not being religious. And uh, it's, 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 it's a huge part of who I am musically and, and the way I think about the world. Um, so it's always gonna be there, but I'm not personally religious now. So I think like, like for African Americans, like when we talk about this notion you know, of struggle, it's always, like for black folks, it's, it's, you know, it's you know, pretty much come from religion. Like that's been, you know, the thing. Yeah, and there's, there's kind of the, uh, what was considered the apocalyptic way of thinking about the world is that maybe it's terrible here, but, but after this life, things will be made right. Yeah, yeah. And I think we were able to take comfort in that in the black community, and, and, and it was a narrative that was taken from the Bible, but it was, you know, it was applicable to us um, in slavery, um, in the civil rights era, that we figured in this life it may not be great, but, um, but you know, if we live right, there'll be a better life afterwards. But if you don't have that, yeah. that so where do you if you're from? not convinced of that, uh, then, then it's like my song, Marching Into the Dark, it says, uh, if you don't believe in an afterlife, like, 
is it worth it, like, to, to die for this? Like, because you're not going to sit up in heaven and look down and say, oh, my work was worth it. Like, that's it after you die, if you don't believe in that. And so I think you just got to make this life the best life you can. And part of that is by trying to make it better for your kids and make it better for your community, better for make, just make it a better world. And that's, that's the way I approach life. Yeah. And I think also it's always powerful to feel deep in your bones that God is on your side. You know, it's powerful. But it, if once you don't feel that, like, <laughs> what do you do? Like, if you're not convinced of that and there's a strong case for black folks to make that he's not been on our side for quite a while now. Um, like, <laughs> like, how do you feel after that? So there's this um, theory, and I think it goes especially for black music. And, you know, I mean, like you can extend this out, I guess, to art that when the politics are sometimes at their worst, you get the most, you know, in yeah. inspirational art. Yeah. You know? are, are well, you we know what the 60s and 70s are obviously a fertile period for music. And, you know, we had the Vietnam War. We had the Civil Rights, uh, you know, uh, movement. And uh, we had a lot of upheaval socially. And our artists were, like, writing about it and singing about it. And, you know, a lot of great art was made. So I said that in an interview the other day. You don't want to have to get to that point. <laughs> but... Maybe this will be an interesting time. Right. Well, we're going to start off by hearing some of that art tonight. Thank you guys so much. Great Thank you.